My name is Catherine McNamara, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues. On behalf of the Clark Forum and the United States Army War College, it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, At the Edge of History. During the early 1960s, the administration of President John F. Kennedy faced a series of crises. Ted Sorensen played a pivotal role in advising the president through these events. Hired as a legislative assistant, he gradually rose from assistant to research aide to speechwriter to campaigner and advisor. Upon his successful 1960 election, President Kennedy appointed Sorensen as his special counsel. In this role, Sorensen served as the president's own lawyer, speechwriter, and trusted confidant. Working collaboratively, Sorensen and Kennedy authored some of the president's best known phrases from the We Stand at the Edge of a New Frontier speech at the 1960 Democratic Convention to the 1961 inaugural address, Ask Not What Your Country Can Do for You. Following President Kennedy's assassination, Sorensen pursued a legal career at Paul, Weiss, Rifkin, Warden, and Garrison LLP. Here he advised U.S. corporations on factories in Russia and Africa, pipelines in the Caribbean and Latin America, and disputes in the Middle East and North America, and negotiated on their behalf with government officials at the highest level in dozens of countries. Mr. Sorensen has also served on the boards of the Central Asian American Enterprise Fund, covering Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan, and the Commission on White House Fellows. He is experienced in the ways of Washington, the United Nations, and the multi multilateral and U.S. financing institutions. Mr. Sorensen's memoirs, Counselor, A Life at the Edge of History, were published by HarperCollins in May 2008. Following this event, there will be a book signing, and books will be available for purchase. At this time, I'd like to remind you to please turn off all cell phones and pagers. Also, please hold all questions until the question and answer session at the end of the program. Because this program is being taped, and out of courtesy to those audience members who are hearing impaired, please wait for our microphone to reach you before asking a question. And now please join me in welcoming Ted Sorensen. Thanks, Catherine. I asked you to make it fair, factual, and funny. Two out of three is not bad. <laughs> but it was completely accurate, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate this uh, turnout. 81 years ago, as a matter of fact, 81 years ago um, next week, uh, when I was born, uh, my father was running for Attorney General of Nebraska. And uh, as Attorney General, he later told me, he was invited to address the uh, convicts in the state penitentiary uh, in my hometown of Lincoln one Sunday morning at their chapel service. And he stood up there. Well, he wasn't certain how to begin, just like I'm not. And he couldn't say my friends. He didn't want to acknowledge knowing any of them. <laughs> he could hardly say ladies and gentlemen. That would be stretching it a bit. Fellow citizens might be rubbing in the fact he had taken uh, citizenship rights uh, away from some of them. So he said he, he just began, uh, as I will now, I'm glad to see so many of you here. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many audiences don't get the joke there. But uh... Yes, uh, the subtitle of my book, and I hope I'll have the pleasure of uh, signing lots of books for uh, all of you here uh, tonight. The subtitle is uh, A Life at the Edge of History. A little secret, assuming there's no uh, press here, uh, is that my publisher originally wanted the subtitle to be A Life in the Shadows of Power. I said, shadows sounds uh, sinister, and I don't think my role was sinister. And if you read the book, and my publisher should read the book, uh, power <laughs> is not what I wielded. I advised people in power. I assisted people in power. I didn't uh, wield it myself. So I much preferred uh, a life at the edge of history. I had the good fortune of being involved uh, 
with history, and that's in a sense what the book is about. I heard since the book came out, indeed I heard just uh, last year when it was about to come out, that the first uh, major library, and this is a town that is involved with our founding fathers and our earliest history, the first library in the uh, new infant United States was burnt down by the British, whether that was in the War of 1812 or otherwise, I don't know. But it uh, left them without a library. And Thomas Jefferson, who uh, was famous for many things, but uh, not uh, economizing in his own personal uh, habits uh, and needed money, had to sell either his wine collection or his library. For some reason, he chose to sell the library. <laughs> and that became the, the first official library of Congress, so to speak, in the country. And I'm told that it had, th he, he had divided it into three sections, memory, reason, and, uh, and imagination. Now I have to assume that memory meant all of his history books. Jefferson was a student of history, which is one of the reasons why he was a great president and leader, because he knew a great deal about ancient history, Roman Greece. He knew a great deal about Western uh, European uh, history. And uh, as my now uh, departed colleague in the White House, uh, Arthur Seisinger Jr., once said, history to a nation is like memory to an individual. If you lose your memory, you don't know where you've been, it's going to be difficult to figure out where you're going. History is the same. If we forget about our history as uh, not Mr. Obama, but his predecessor seemed to do uh, most of the time, we won't know where we've been and we will make the same mistakes uh, over and uh, over again. My book uh, tells about life at the edge of history, beginning uh, with my brilliant choice of parents uh, 81 years ago, uh, because uh, they were uh, <clears throat> thoughtful, highly educated uh, people, and they were determined that uh, all five of their children be uh, thoughtful, highly educated citizens, and they also believed that everyone had an obligation to make this a better country and a better world, as they had. And all five of their children became involved in uh, that kind of uh, work. So that early history, which is the first part of my book, led quite naturally to the second part of my history, which was my 11 years uh, with John F. Kennedy. A lot of luck involved in that, a lot of um, happily being in the right place at the right time. But it was an extraordinary relationship between two people who on the surface appeared to be completely different. He was uh, from a uh, New England family, I was from Nebraska, he had been a war hero, I had been too young to uh, serve. He uh, came from a uh, devout uh, religious Catholic uh, background. I came from Unitarian background, which is basically the other end of that uh, uh, particular uh, scale. And uh, he was a millionaire, and I uh, arrived in Washington looking for a job with my entire fortune uh, being in a thin wallet in my uh, uh, pants pocket. But those differences we found were really differences that didn't make a difference. Because we both had been raised to care about our country, we both believed in public service, we were both interested in public policy, we both wanted to see people at the bottom of the ladder uh, helped uh, to the top. We both were interested in history, we both had uh, enjoyed sense of humor, 
And so we got along extremely well for 11 years. Eight of them, well, he was a senator, and three, he was uh, president. And I hope you'll find uh, that history uh, of interest and with lots of lessons for what faces us today. And the, uh, after Kennedy's death, as, uh, as uh, Catherine said in her introduction, uh, I went to New York, I uh, joined a law firm, I became an international lawyer. I had a lot of interesting challenges and experiences in uh, that role. I told some of them at dinner tonight to a few uh, friends, faculty, students who were uh, gathered at the uh, Thompson Forum uh, establishment. And that is uh, my history. The second part of Jefferson's library he called reason. I assume by that he meant philosophy, policy, perhaps religion, uh, no doubt politics because Jefferson himself was involved in uh, all of those in one uh, aspect or another uh, throughout his life, and uh, so have I been, and that's also what my book is about. As I mentioned, uh, I was brought up a Unitarian, and Unitarians are by nature uh, skeptics who, an who ask a lot of questions, and both as a presidential advisor and as a lawyer, I found there was a lot of value in asking questions, asking uh, tough questions. And so I identify with uh, the second part of Jefferson's uh, library, reason. The third part he called imagination, and I have to assume that meant fiction because Jefferson was familiar with the uh, plays and stories that went back to the Greeks and the ancient uh, Romans. But I want to assure you that nothing in my book is fiction. Uh, everything there is true. Some of it is very immodest, but I stumbled upon and used as my slogan uh, as a saying attributed to... Uh, Dizzy Dean, there's not a single person in this auditorium who remembers who Dizzy Dean was, but he was a great baseball pitcher back in the 1930s and, uh, and early 40s for the St. Louis Cardinals and the Chicago Cubs, and there was talk about him going into the Hall of Fame, and Dizzy uh, immodestly said, if you'd done it, it ain't bragging. So uh, I have adopted that as my motto, uh, <laughs> and uh, I've done uh, quite a few things in my uh, years, uh, especially the 11 years with Kennedy, but I had some interesting experiences, stories to tell from the early years and from the uh, years as a lawyer until... Uh, I don't uh, see well enough anymore to remain a practicing uh, lawyer, but don't uh, worry about uh, my eyesight. Uh, last year, not this, but last year I could say I had more vision than the President of the United States. <laughs> so, um, uh, both Ken well, my parents had brought me up, as I've already indicated, to think about, to imagine, so to speak, what this country could be, what this country should be. That's the way Kennedy thought also. That was imagination. Yes, it's putting imagination to use for, uh, for the public good. Of all the uh, uh, times that imagining what it could be, what it should be, became most important, also drawing upon history, also invoking reason and policy, came during what historians, uh, I hope the historians here, uh, call uh, the most dangerous 13 days in the history of mankind. They were. That's not an exaggeration. If Kennedy or those of us seated around the table with him had made the wrong move, uh, 
during uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis of October, November 1962, all mankind could have been destroyed. And fortunately, we had at that time a president who was objective, cool, wise, careful. And we came through uh, that crisis. And both at the beginning and in the middle of my book, I uh, talk a bit about that crisis, including uh, my role in it. And tomorrow, I'm going to be talking over at the War College about the ethics of presidential decision-making in that kind of crisis. Because the decisions, one after another, presented an ethical dilemma, so to speak, or choice. It began on the morning of uh, October 16, 1962, when the president called me in, told me that... Um, High-flying U-2 planes had photographed uh, what, upon their, upon the development of those photographs and their interpretation by the brilliant CIA photo interpreters and analysts, proved to be the beginnings of nuclear missile sites for intermediate-range nuclear missiles from Moscow which had never before been placed outside Soviet borders. They were so secret. Why now? Why had they been rushed in so quickly, so secretly? Clearly, the intent was to use them. How use them? Use them to devastate our country or other countries in the Western Hemisphere that were within range? Or by nuclear blackmail? Maybe Soviet Chairman Khrushchev was going to show up at the United Nations and make a speech with pictures demonstrating that they had these terrible weapons uh, there 90 miles from our shore and demand that the United States and the West uh, turn over to communism West Berlin, the one free segment of Germany in those days because uh, after World War II, the fortunes of war had, call, had uh, enabled Soviet troops to overrun excuse me, Berlin. Uh, and uh, even though uh, West Berlin was occupied by allied forces, the communist forces of East Germany occupied East Berlin, Khrushchev, called that a bone in his throat, pretty good uh, metaphor for uh, what was caused, and that's where Western will was uh, being tested most. So the president told me he was calling a meeting for the, later that morning. Now here's the first decision he had to make, the first ethical question he had to make. Should he call the National Security Council? That's what the law provided. And the trouble is, that's what the law provided, because there was a federal statute which said who's on the National Security Council, and everybody who was on it, uh, of course, insisted on showing up. That proved how important he was. And to show even more how important he was, he would want to bring his deputy with him, and his deputy had to bring his assistant with him, and pretty soon you'd have a room full of people too large to make the kind of crisp, thoughtful decision that Kennedy wanted to make and too large to keep a secret and Kennedy felt this was one secret that had to be kept. And so he spoke with me about who should be called and come to the meeting and he wanted me to come to the meeting. He wanted his brother Bob, the Attorney General, to come to the meeting. Neither one of us were experts in national security matters. Neither was the Secretary of Treasury, the leading Republican in our uh, cabinet, but Kennedy wanted at that meeting those individuals whose judgment he trusted, whose recommendations he thought would be uh, important, and that's whom he gathered uh, around the table later that morning. And that's where the second decision came. Was he to take a decision on a particular course of action, the same way recently a president took 
a decision without considering any uh, alternatives and, uh, and say, yes, that's what we will do? No. Kennedy said, I want you around this table to tell me every possible option, military option, diplomatic option, combined military diplomatic options, and I want you to tell me the pros and the cons of every one of them. Even the option of doing nothing at all, although politically we probably could not uh, accept that. And that is exactly uh, what we did, and we began to weigh a variety of options, and that was so much wiser and, and so much better for the long-range interests of the Congress. And it led to a third decision with an ethical uh, dimension. And that is, do we tell our allies? Do we consult with our allies? We didn't tell or consult with anybody before we invaded Iraq. Kennedy thought that we lived in a dangerous, complicated world. We could not, should not try to go it alone on what might be mankind's final war. Our allies could provide advice, experience, sometimes intelligence, uh, uh, on what was going on, and uh, he decided that we should. And he sent uh, high-level emissaries to brief the uh, Prime Minister of England, the Chancellor of West Germany, the NATO Council, and the most difficult of all our allies, President de Gaulle of France. For de Gaulle, he selected our most eminent diplomat, uh, retired statesman, the former Secretary of State, Dean Acheson. And Acheson went in to see uh, de Gaulle and uh, drawing upon the President's uh, speech of six days later, the night of October 22nd, which I'll come to in a minute, Acheson said, now, Mr. President, do you know what the policy of the president is and why he wants to do it? But sitting in your outer office is an Air Force colonel, a lot of colonels around here uh, over at the uh, War College, and uh, he has the pictures. And he will come in here with a pointer and put the pictures up on the wall and show you why we are convinced that these are uh, nuclear missile sites and de Gaulle waved him off and said, no, no, the word of the President of the United States is good enough for me. I think that would be true today if uh, President Obama sent an emissary to any one of our allies. I know it was true uh, during the days of Kennedy, Franklin Roosevelt, a few others, but it certainly wouldn't have been true uh, a year or several years uh, ago. The word of the United, President of the United States was not good enough uh, for anyone. So I think uh, briefing our allies was the right thing to do. And Kennedy went beyond that. He also, here again, ethical question, he wanted to adhere to international law. So many people say international law, that's, uh, that's nothing. That's just uh, a lot of diplomats in striped pants uh, talking. There's no real police force. There's no real courts. There's no real uh, this or that. Well, uh, international law, I can tell you, is for real. And so is international public opinion. And Kennedy wanted to pay attention to international law in part because he wanted to win international public opinion behind him. And that turned out to be important. A little-known incident in the following week, the week after his speech, came when the Soviets decided to send equipment, presumably military equipment, to Cuba by plane because, as I will mention in a minute, the United States had put a blockade around Cuba. That plane, there may have been two of them, required refueling and landing rights in West Africa to get to Cuba. 
and two West African countries that were not particularly friendly to the United States had been won over by Kennedy's frank presentation of the evidence and his adherence to international law, and they denied the Soviet Union cargo plane or planes those landing and refueling rights, and I believe that's when Khrushchev first began to realize that what he would later call a reckless gamble had backfired. So once again, I think Kennedy uh, was right. And then he decided to present our case not only to the United Nations, but to the Organization of American States, which is like a regional uh, UN, and the Organization of American States, with only one abstention because the ambassador couldn't get approval from his home government in time, voted to endorse and adopt that blockade or quarantine, as we called it. And by the way, we called it quarantine because a blockade can be an act of war. And we weren't intending to keep out food, medicine, fuel, it was a quarantine against offensive weapons. And when the regional body, the Organization of American States, adopted it as their own, it became a regional security arrangement which the United Nations Charter authorizes. And once again, Kennedy had acted in accordance with international law. Then came the next tough decision with a dim an ethical dimension. And that is, uh, what should our response be? At that first morning's meeting, everybody agreed that the simplest, most obvious response was what they called a surgical airstrike. Sounded good. U.S. planes swoop in, bomb those Soviet nuclear sites, fly away. Magic. You've just restored the... Uh, what the, the status quo ante, the way it was. It wasn't that simple. First, the president, who also would like to ask tough questions, asked uh, how sure was the Air Force they would get them all. The Air Force said they were 80% uh, sure they could get 80% of them. That would leave only 20% uh, to kill uh, millions of uh, people in the United States. That wasn't good enough for President uh, Kennedy. And the Air Force said, we don't send our planes up there over Cuba without taking some other actions. We would have to bomb all of the Soviet surface-to-air missiles because otherwise they would shoot down our planes. We're not going to risk them. We would also have to bomb the Soviet and Cuban air bases so they don't send bombers over to knock out Miami while we're busy over Cuba. And pretty soon they had a list of targets, the length and breadth of Cuba, and what had been first described as a uh, surgical airstrike had become a massive bombing raid on Cuba, which they acknowledged would lead to so much destruction and chaos that the United States would then have to invade to uh, restore order. Around the table, there was some division as to uh, whether that was, uh, after the first day, as to whether that was the best solution because Bobby Kennedy raised an ethical question in our meeting the next morning. He said that airstrike would inevitably kill a lot of Cuban workers at the site. We're not trying to... Uh, destroy Cuba or Cubans, they're innocent, and history would regard this as a Pearl Harbor in reverse. And the, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, an air, a surprise air attack killed a lot of uh, innocent civilians as well as knocking out the U.S. Uh, fleet. And the idea of the U.S. being regarded by history as having done that uh, as the attacking power uh, did not appeal to uh, very many people around the table. Bobby suggested there be some way of warning uh, 
those uh, on the target that uh, the, such an attack would come. Again, uh, taking an ethical point of view, Air Force wasn't keen about warning their targets. They said uh, the missiles might be hidden in, in the underbrush or in caves. But finally, it was agreed that I would draft a letter from the president to Khrushchev to be handed personally to Khrushchev by a high-level emissary, warning him that unless those missiles were dismantled or withdrawn by a date certain, that uh, the U.S. would have to bomb them. Please be aware. Get innocent people out of the way. And then once the... the uh, that I had, been, I had received that uh, mandate. Uh, everybody around the table began to chip in with his, uh, or her, yeah, there were only he's around that table, uh, his uh, condition. Don't make it sound like an ultimatum. Superpowers don't respond to ultimata. Don't make it complicated. Khrushchev, if it's complicated, will negotiate for weeks or months, and by that time the missile sites will be finished and ready to fire. Don't make it too one-sided because history will then blame the United States for what may be mankind's final war. I went back to my office and uh, tried to write a letter, and it was impossible to meet all those conditions. Of course it sounded like an ultimatum. It was an ultimatum. Of course it was complicated. It had to be complicated. Of course it was one-sided. It was all our side. But uh, I finally went back with a draft, which I said doesn't, uh, doesn't meet those uh, criteria, and support for the uh, airstrike scenario began to uh, fade. And support began to grow for one of the other options that had been on this list of options that uh, we had presented to Kennedy at his request, and that was the blockade option. Put a, a ring of destroyers around Cuba to keep any more military equipment, particularly nuclear strike equipment, out. We did not know with any certainty whether warheads, nuclear warheads, had been delivered. Whether, were they on the island somewhere? Were they in those caves? Uh, were they ready to be loaded onto the missiles? If not, perhaps we could prevent that through the blockade. And uh, here again, it so happens that yesterday afternoon in my home, I was in, interviewed by the granddaughter of the uh, then head of the CIA, John McCone. And I told her that because he had been in the shipping business, he raised a very practical point which is of importance to those who say international law doesn't mean anything. Well, international law applies to, he, he had been in the shipping business and he knew a lot about shipping cargoes and the insurance costs. And he said if, there, if a blockade is an act of war to ship cargoes, to send ships through a war zone, the insurance is 20 times higher and all of our allies in Europe who want to send anything through the uh, Caribbean will be uh, very upset with us. And that was one reason why we moved from blockade to quarantine, because we had no intention, as I mentioned, of keeping out the necessities of life, and the quarantine uh, was not a violation of international law, and support began to grow uh, for, uh, for that uh, Alternative. Finally, on uh, I uh, uh, was asked by the group I was part of, which was the uh, the, uh, the quarantine uh, or blockade group, not the airstrike group, if I would draft a speech because they said at the end of the process, the president's going to make a speech to the country, and that's how he's going to convey his decision. And we might as well be ready. You should draft a speech for him and that way explain what it's all about. And I went back to my office again and tried, and I had too many questions. How's a blockade going to get rid of the missiles? How's a blockade going to keep them from being fired? How's a blockade going to solve this conflict? I went back to the meeting of our group. I raised those questions, and... 
The answers were discussed, and I then returned to my office with those answers and spent a very, very long night uh, uh, making the first draft uh, of that speech. And when I returned uh, the next morning, they said, uh, let's go with this. Bobby Kennedy called his brother, who was on a campaign uh, commitment uh, tour, because this goes back to uh, what I said, uh, he didn't want it so big a group that the secret would be out. The president said to us in that first Tuesday morning meeting, we have an advantage in that the Soviets don't know that we know what they're up to. Once they find out, we know they could take some kind of preemptive action, either a speech or an attack. But right now, they can't, they won't take a preemptive action because they think we're still in the dark and we have at least a week until all this leaks out to uh, carefully plan, uh, formulate to what our response will be. Well, it did leak out in a week and the two newspapers that found out a good deal of information agreed in response to a personal call from the president to hold off publication until at least he could give his speech to the nation so that the people didn't learn for the first time on a television speech. Uh, so, the pres- so, they, so they did learn from the president's speech the way he wanted it put and the, putting it in context and, uh, uh, and all uh, the rest. So uh, the president uh, came back. So he said, everybody should uh, not only don't tell anything to your spouses or secretaries, but please don't have your limousines waiting for you outside the White House. People will see a big crowd of uh, official limousines and they'll know there's some kind of emergency meeting going on and the Soviets will guess what it's about. And keep your campaign commitments, keep your dinner party commitments, just like pretend that life as usual is, uh, is going on, which is why he had taken that trip out to Indiana and then uh, Chicago. He came back. And I hope you will read in the book the one-page memorandum I handed him when he came back, which summed up one paragraph each, what I thought was the strongest case for the blockade option and the strongest case against the airstrike uh, option. And uh, the president opted for, uh, for the blockade. And even though when he called in from all over the country, leaders of the Congress They all wanted an airstrike. They all said the blockade was too passive. Even his own Joint Chiefs of Staff thought that he should hit them hard, to quote one of the uh, generals uh, uh, present at that uh, somewhat stormy meeting. And the president kept his cool. He uh, tried to make clear to both the generals and the congressional leaders that he had broader responsibilities, including safeguarding the freedom of West Berlin and trying to prevent a uh, global uh, war. And uh, he proceeded with that uh, speech. I uh, interrupt here for one minute to say that when I give this uh, talk around the country over the last year or so, actually going back uh, uh, three years because that was the 50th anniversary or 40th, sorry, 40th anniversary three years ago. Uh, men um, younger than I, about your age, uh, come up to me afterwards and thank me for making President Kennedy's speech to the country on the night of October 22nd so scary that they were able to persuade their college girlfriends it was their last night on earth together. <laughs> so those are, uh, those are some of the ethical problems 
that uh, faced uh, the President of the United States, and it was our good fortune, and we're all here to talk about it today, that, uh, that he was a man uh, who was as wise and cool and objective a decision maker as he was. He had barely won election by the narrowest popular vote margin in the history of the 20th century in 1960, but it's a good thing for the country that he was the man in the Oval Office at the uh, time of those uh, particularly dangerous 13 days. He used to uh, end all of his campaign speeches with a story which uh, he and I thought came from Alastair Cook, a name some of you may remember, British correspondent. And uh, I found out later on it came from a distinguished New England poet, James or Greenleaf Whittier or John. Uh, and uh, the story was about Colonel Davenport. And every time the press traveling with us around the country heard the words Colonel Davenport, they would put down their pencils and close their notebooks because they'd already heard the story a hundred times. And they knew that was the end of the speech and they would turn around to go back and get on the press bus so they could get a seat close to the president. And the story is about a meteorological phenomenon that took place in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, one day in the 18th century. And it caused the skies at noon to uh, darken until inside the colonial legislative assembly, it became black and men fell on their knees, some crying out in terror, many in prayer. And Colonel Davenport was the speaker of the assembly and he said, gentlemen, there were no ladies in the old Connecticut uh, colonial assembly. Gentlemen, either the day of judgment is here or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause for alarm. If it is, I prefer to be found doing my duty. I ask, therefore, that candles be brought. And Kennedy would then say, uh, a national presidential election is a way by which all of our citizens bring candles to light our nation's way. All of you here, students, faculty, in your own way, and particularly in the public service to which I hope you are headed, will be bringing candles to light our nation's way, for which I thank you. We'll now be holding the question and answer session. Again, please hold your questions until the microphone reaches you. Yes, because I can't see when hands are raised. Okay, I'll pull up a chair then right beside you. Either way. Good? Okay. Ah, yes. Hope you don't mind if I sit while we have Q&A. My mic on? Um, thank you so much for coming. First of all, um, I was wondering if, um, like before you said that it's really important to ask questions, um, and I was wondering if you could tell us what you think the most important question is for the American public to ask the new administration right now. Right now? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure we all have our favorites for that. And... Uh, I'm a big supporter of President Obama from the day he declared for the presidency, so he won't like uh, my saying this. But I think the question I would put to him is, by what authority can he say that the CIA practitioners of torture 
who violated the law, American law, international law, as well as every precept of morality that any religion in the world teaches, how can he say they're not going to be prosecuted? Does he have that authority? Thank you, sir. Could you give us any insights on where President Kennedy's thinking was headed on U.S. engagement in Vietnam? Yes, I certainly can by uh, asking you to read my book. <laughs> I uh, looked into that with uh, some care, and uh, I think that he never would have sent combat troop divisions to South Vietnam because he had rejected that recommendation at least three times during his presidency. He had sent a variety, at least three missions out. Take a look at South Vietnam. Come back and tell me what can be done uh, uh, to preserve the country, its independence, its freedom. And almost all of them came back and said, in military instructors and advisors, which, is, which were started by Eisenhower and which Kennedy uh, continued and reinforced. In fact, he enlarged it somewhat. That's not enough. We have to actually send combat troop divisions to South Vietnam and bomb North Vietnam. That's the only chance. He heard them, but he never did it. And I don't believe he ever would have done it because he had discovered in a variety of other crises, including Cuba and Congo, even uh, in its way, uh, Berlin, that you don't solve political problems and so-called regime change is at its essence a political problem. You don't solve political problems with military answers. You wipe them out with the military and the political problem bubbles right back up to the top again. Kennedy, as a senator, had given an extraordinary speech on independence for Algeria, making the same point that Algerians who were determined to have freedom and independence after decades of colonialism were not going to permit some foreign, western, white country or army to beat them or to dominate them or to occupy their land. And he had made a similar speech about Indochina. And I think that he would have tried to find some way to negotiate a way out. He even uh, sent out some feelers uh, about that. I can't tell you with certainty that's uh, what he was going to do at the first month or the second month of 63, because I don't think he knew with a certainty what he was going to do in the first month or the second month of 63. All of that's uh, in the book, and I'd be interested in your uh, views after you take a look at that. Were you satisfied with the Warren Commission's final report? Yes. It's not a subject that I like to discuss. It's mentioned in my book as carefully as I can because it's a uh, terrible subject. No one likes to believe, including me, that Kennedy died for no reason at all because uh, mentally ill but lucky sharpshooter killed him uh, for no apparent uh, purpose. Uh, people want to think Kennedy was a martyr. People around the world want to say he, he died for peace or he died for independence or uh, whatever. And uh, there are some who think that there was a conspiracy to kill him because he was turning toward peace. But I don't think there's any evidence that would... Uh, 
hold up in court to, to support that thesis. Uh, thank you very much for coming, sir. Uh, you had mentioned inter international law uh, several times in your speech, but I was curious if you look at issues in the world today, North Korea, Iran, Darfur, uh, issues that international law has really done little to address or solve. Uh, if you were advising President Obama, where would you tell him the line should be drawn where unilateral action should be taken on those issues? If by unilateral action you mean unilateral military action, I don't see how U.S. Milita unilateral military action could do anything in Darfur. And I think it would be extremely dangerous for the United States military, and I think everyone in the United States military would agree with me, would to take any unilateral action against North Korea, whose forces, including their missiles, are just a very short distance away from large encampments of American troops and from the city of Seoul, South Korea, it would be uh, stupid as well as destructive for the United States to take unilateral action against North Korea. North Koreans know how to dodge and duck and uh, twist the facts and the tail of the lion. But uh, diplomacy has twice had some success there. It's unfortunate that some people in our own country have objected to the success there. But uh, they will realize if North Korea, with its uh, somewhat distorted view of the world, ever develops a nuclear arsenal. So diplomacy takes time, takes a lot of patience. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's worth taking that time. In Darfur, I think that ultimately the International Criminal Court arrest warrant for the president of uh, the Sudan combined with UN sanctions, economic sanctions against Sudan, combined with the Organization of African Unity, OAU, isolating that president uh, from uh, in a, the African community, though they don't like, frankly, to crack down on their any fellow president. I think that combination, as awkward as it, and time-consuming as it may be, is a whole lot better than uh, than sending American forces to uh, die in an African jungle. I was curious, you mentioned uh, the UN uh, and also other international organizations. I know the UN has been criticized for not really having any kind of military presence uh, or any kind of standing army to enforce any kind of sanction that they go up, that they actually put forward. Uh, you mentioned economic sanctions, which can also obviously have some effect. But I was curious, uh, in your experience, has there been any talks or any emphasis on maybe creating a standing army for the UN in order to enforce those sanctions? Over the years, there has been a proposal which is not unlike what the founding fathers of the UN had in mind, which is that all countries that are able to do so set aside a particular segment of their armed forces which would be ready to participate in a UN joint action. I think there are those at the Pentagon who would resist that because American armed forces are stretched too thin now because of the perpetual war policy of the previous administration. But I think in time, something of that uh, may come to pass. But I'm not certain the United States uh, wants the, uh, the UN to have a, uh, a standing uh, army that is uh, not subject to the legal and parliamentary and other uh, restraints that most uh, national armies uh, are uh, subject to. So I fully understand uh, the frustration, but the United Nations has won many victories for peace, 
including health and environment and human rights. And I think uh, in the long run, that's more valuable than it acquiring a reputation for war. Uh, Mr. Sorensen, um, you had mentioned that you were a, a famous uh, early supporter of President Obama. And I had actually attended a, a book talk of yours in the fall, and a lot of the questions prior to the election. Sorry, you'll have to speak up. I don't uh, know. A lot of the questions prior to the election that you had were concerning your relationship with President Obama. Now that we have, or candidate Obama, now that we have a President Obama, do you feel more free to speak about your relationship? Uh, did he actually seek your advice? My relationship with Obama? Yes. Yes, correct. Well, um, I think the uh, shortest answer is a sentence in John F. Kennedy's inaugural address when he said, the torch has been passed to a new generation. I uh, like Obama, I've met him, but I'm not part of the inner circle. The young man who helped serve as my eyes uh, in writing the uh, book I'm going to sign tonight, uh, when he left uh, working with me on the book, uh, went to join Obama's speech writing team, and he's still a member of that team in the White House today. So if I uh, am desperate to get an idea in, I know how to do it. <laughs> uh, sort of bringing the discussion back to uh, what Mike said about uh, a standing army and the UN, uh, the United States has sort of had a pattern through, uh, for decades through Republican and, and Democratic uh, administrations of not binding itself to seemingly any sort of international obligations, not the International Criminal Court. Uh, we took 40 years to ratify the prohibition against genocide. We still haven't ratified the rights of the child. I was wondering if there's anything... That's very good. You're well informed. Uh, thank you. I was wondering if there's anything in your experience that lends yourself to wondering or answering why is our country in particular such an outlier uh, when it comes to agreeing to international conventions? That's a very good question, and I wish I knew the answer. Uh, to that question, but don't go back too far when you say that, uh, because under uh, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, the United States was a participant in most international uh, conventions. We helped initiate many treaties. We did sign on uh, until the, uh, there was a change of, uh, shall we say, uh, mood and attitude in the country. And uh, we began to get people in high office who regarded allies as backseat drivers, to quote uh, one of them, and who said that uh, treaties are for, they're supposed to, those are for bad people. We don't need uh, treaties to... Uh, limit us, uh, what we can do. And it's, uh, it's sad because international law, of which John F. Kennedy talked about quite a bit, a world of law, as he put it, is uh, ultimately the solution for the uh, increasing uh, danger and mess that, uh, that we are in. And my hope is that uh, President Obama is the one leader of uh, our time who recognizes that, who will restore America's leadership in the United Nations, in the international community, and in the development of international law. We have time for one last question. Oh, shucks. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Sorensen. Um, I was just curious, uh, especially in light of um, Senator Specter's um, change to the Democratic Party. What did? You... When did that happen? Today. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. I'm delighted to hear that because we need every possible vote <laughs> to overcome some of the things he stood for all these years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Well, I'm just joking. He's a very able man. He was on the staff of the Warren Commission. My question is, um, with, with, uh, in light of that, how do, what would you like to see um, Mr. Obama and the Congress achieve uh, during his first term? Oh. Uh, what, what would be your priority, I suppose? Well, uh, he has already said that his three priorities, and uh, well, four. Number one is an, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an entire package of economic measures to try to restore confidence in American economic leadership, America's financial institutions, get consumers to start buying, uh, whether it's automobiles or other products, get investors to start investing in American uh, projects, get foreigners to have some trust in America's uh, money. And uh, so that package uh, has to be a priority, because if our economy is sinking and staggering the way it has been, uh, almost none of the others are going to be doable. Second priority is uh, national health. We're the in only industrialized nation in the world, almost the only nation, only nation in the world, that doesn't have a national health care system. And in the richest, or once was, I, maybe we will be again, the richest country in the world to have people dying or permanently disabled because they are unable to afford uh, medical care in this country when uh, somehow other countries find a way to do it. I think that's uh, just indefensible. I might add a small personal note in that regard. Uh, I'm, uh, this is too personal, and I hope we're off the record here. I'm told that after a stroke, my eyes still have the ingredients of sight, in terms of eye components, but the, the uh, control room behind the eyes is all messed up from the stroke of the brain hemorrhage, and that eight or 10 years of stem cell research may develop the ability to replace those uh, whatever they are, nerves and so on, including the optic nerve, that will enable me to play tennis again. <laughs> and uh, eight or 10 years, I just gave up eight years of stem cell research during the Bush administration, and I'm pretty mad about that. So health, energy independence is uh, number three on Obama's uh, list, I would think. This country is the most wasteful country in the world, the way we burn up and consume gasoline, oil, everything that comes from fossil fuels, which come mostly from Arab and other countries who hate us, and they take our billions and convert it into weapons that someday they're going to use against us, and that policy, and we borrow billions and billions from the Chinese in order to pay off these uh, Arab oil merchants. That is a policy that makes no sense at all. And there are a lot of, and at the same time we have, and this is also on, among Obama's priorities, the threat of global warming. It's not a hoax. It's not uh, imaginary. We don't see it day by day, but there is no question about the statistics that demonstrate that the polar caps are melting, the ice is softening, the waters are rising, and over the long run, I know you and I won't be here in the long run, but over the long run, our grandchildren will be here, and this will be a very different planet, and we better start uh, acting now and changing our energy uh, policies is an important part of that. And fourth and finally, on his uh, list of priorities is and should be education. We complain about the fact that globalization means we're competing with the rest of the world. Well, if, that's, uh, if that is such a danger, why aren't our students doing better in engineering and math and science 
and all the new intellectual developments where many countries in the world are ahead of us. And uh, somebody mentioned outliers a, a minute ago. There's one of the chapters in the book, Outliers, that uh, points out uh, we're the only country in the world which is so uh, confident that we, uh, going back to the f days when we needed everybody on the farm, we still uh, give uh, students uh, three months off when they could be uh, studying and learning. I know none of you wants to go to school all year round, but uh, <laughs> the fact is there is so much we could do to uh, improve and upgrade our education system, including treating our teachers not as hired hands who don't have full rights, but as the valuable professionals uh, they are who we depend upon to uh, lead this country to uh, the kind of highly trained in the new air areas of intellectual property and all the things I don't understand uh, about uh, computers and internet and all of that. Uh, it's the teachers that will take us there and uh, we should respect them uh, for what they're doing. So I think those are Obama's priorities. And if he, for a change, could get one member of the Republican Party in the House, just one, to uh, start supporting him on uh, some of these programs, uh, then I think uh, as long and formidable as that list is, I think he's going to do it. And if he asks me, whether the country can do it, I'm going to say, yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again to our very distinguished speaker, Mr. Sorensen. Um, there will be a book signing again after, right now. Um, the books will be available for purchase. Please join us. This concludes tonight's event. Thank you for attending.